It's not all one and the same. <clears throat> Hiring your staff and building your team, it's not the same as placing a one ad. The first thing you want to do, and we're going to discuss in this section, is your staff audit. Find out, write down, what are the skills that your current staff have? What are the times they're available? Where are the holes in your program? Write your job description for the person you want, not the person you're willing to take. So many programs find themselves so desperate for staff that they'll take anybody, a warm body, somebody who's breathing, somebody who meets the basic job requirements they can see and hear children at all times. I'm hoping that you're going to learn from our discussion why you want so much more for your program. Take advantage of what your staff have to offer. Find out what their availability is, their skills with different groups, not just where you currently have them in the classroom. If they like computers or they're really into social media like we talked about earlier, get them to help you with your Twitter accounts, Facebook. Get them to help you. You want to let them take on some of your monkeys. Okay, don't hire staff that are gonna create more monkeys for you because they have to be gone by three o'clock and you thought you were hiring for the person who can close your program. Once you're aware of the actual holes in your program, at that point in time, write your job description. If there are things you wanna offer in your program, like you'd like your program to be able to have a foreign language component, then write your job description for a person who can speak a second language. If you don't care, just write a second language. If you're specific and there's a specific language you want taught, put that in your job description. Anytime you put together a job description, don't forget to include your pay scale. Earlier we talked about having community gardens or school gardens uh, there in your program. You can use them as part of your marketing when the kids are using herbs from their garden into their spaghetti sauce. You can use it when uh, you are just trying to do something neat with your curriculum. And so maybe it's a schoolyard habitat, it's all about animals, or maybe it's vegetable gardening. Either way, include that in your job description if no one else on your staff has currently got that interest. Your job description should be written before you place your first ad. Now what you do, and you have your job description, some great places to place your ad is in your building. Let your staff know what you're hiring for because they may have a friend. Let your parents know. If you have a website or a newsletter, send it out that way. And then start to look for free resources to post your ad long before you start looking at the traditional paper. Look at college campuses, community colleges, tech programs near you. And don't forget their use. They have great, great opportunities for you to meet uh, college students, college graduates who are looking for jobs through their career placement offices. One of my favorite places right now for hiring staff are things like Craigslist or the Green Sheet. Usually these are free to, no, free to low cost places for you to place one ads. When you're doing your staff audit, one of the things I want you to remember, and we've talked about it earlier, well, we touched on it briefly, is that your staff is your biggest investment in your program. So only hire the people who are gonna help you in your program. Job descriptions should be kept up to date and they should be kept in your employee handbook. Knowing what you are hiring for, what classroom, when, what skills do you want them to have, this is important. You have to know this long before you place that ad. So you've written your job description. Now you need to want, write your one ad. Remember what kind of program you are. If you're all about a staff person who's fun, make sure your job description and your one ad sounds fun. One of my favorite was a job description that included plain and Play-Doh and plain dress up as part of the job description. Make sure you know what you want your staff to be like. Do you want them to be creative? Do you want them to be more of a grandparent type? Do you want them to be able to build relationships with your family? If you're a Montessori, Montessori program, if you're proud of your program's cultural diversity, 
Let your future employees know what you are proud of. Again, these are the kind of things that we talk about in the marketing section that you did in your homework. What is it you're proud of? Let your future staff know this as well. Please pause this video, read the chapter on staffing, hiring, and team building, and then come back and join me. In the observation guidance chapter, you're going to learn more about recognizing your staff and observing them being great. You have two assignments related to this subject in your homework tab. First, you need to staff a program. Remember that you need to understand how you can save money while staffing your program for quality and the comfort level of your staff. Forget minimum standards. They're the minimum. Think about the quality program you want and where, how comfortable are your staff with your staff to student ratio. You don't have to use all the staff on that list. Think about what you would do with them. Second is a staff training plan. The information should include when you are going to do your CPR and first aid for your staff, shake and baby, and any other mandated training. Think of the resources available for you to train your staff. There's professional organizations. We've talked about those in, in the professional, professionalism, quality, and advocacy section. There's minimum standards, and the minimum standards chapters, each one of those sections make great training resources for your staff. Online resources, doctors, parents, this video, your director credentialing book. These are all resource materials that you can use to train your staff. We want you to think about how you're going to do this. Is this going to be lunchtime staff meetings, staff meetings after work, before work, staff trainings twice a year where you really get into the nuts and bolts and your staff gets an opportunity to hear from a variety of speakers. Use the other directors in your community. Let them be the experts. Although some programs allow the staff person to be in charge of it themselves, to be, that the staff person's in charge of their own training, you're the director. You can determine what you want them to be trained in. And what a great way for you to sell your program to parents. Introduce your parents to staff in an appropriate classroom and indicate their recent training and strength. Susie's one of your teachers, and Susie has just attended one of the neatest classes you've heard of in infant curriculum. So why not tell the next infant parent who comes through your program about Susie's workshop and what she learned? Let Susie tell them and let Susie share how she is incorporating this into their classroom. Let your program stay vibrant. Your staff are professionals. They're required continuing education, 15 to 20 hours a year. This exceeds other professions, and like other professionals, they have that continuing education. CPAs are required to have continuing education. Doctors, lawyers, physicians assistants, nurses, nursing, nursing practitioners. All of these professions are required to have professional development somewhere between 20 and 50 hours a year. So are your early child care professionals. All right, welcome back. Once you have your job description, you post the ad, you take applications, you interview, do your orientation, continue your training and your evaluation. Now that you've invested this much time into hiring the correct person for your program, make sure they stay with you. Train them and support their career. Make sure they know that they are important to your program. This is key to team building. Team building is not going out on the weekends and playing softball. This is not something you might see in a high adventure course like big corporations do. Team building is all about you being committed to your team. Did you have problems getting here? You know, I kind of got lost. I wasn't, I didn't, I'm not doing directions. <laughs> well, a lot of people have problems talking to me, so I'm not surprised. But I'm just glad that you're here. 
And uh, the position that you're applying for is volleyball umpire. Oh, really? That's a lot. Really? Well, that's physical work. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about the job. Okay. It before, it's 10 to 15 hours a week. It pays 12 to $14 an hour. And uh, I do require staff to be show up 30 minutes before shift to set the nets up. Oh. And then after they get through at the end of the night, they can take the nets down. Okay. And, uh, like I said, it's, you get paid every once every two weeks, depending on, on your experience. You want to tell me a little bit about your uh, background as far as your experience? Well, I haven't been around kids a lot. I do a lot of waitressing. But this I'm is actually, let me, let me this is this is actually, this actually has to do with adults. So. Oh, okay. Well, I can work with adults, too. Okay. I work in restaurants. I, I waitress. But I'm like I said, I'm open to new experiences. Do you have any experience officiating at all? No, I don't. Well, I'm sorry, the job is not. No home. I'm interviewing. I've got three more interviews this afternoon, and I am looking for somebody that's got some experience. Okay. And uh, possibly has a certification, but I do appreciate you coming by, and I will let everybody know by this Friday by telephone that I will call you. Okay. For a second interview, and I sure if you have any questions at this time, you have them. No, I just wait to hear from you on Friday. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for coming. <laughs> lot of information in the textbook about staffing and hiring, a lot of legalities and let's just say the theory of hiring. I want to take you through some of the possible ways, some of the things that will help you in your hiring process or at least they've helped me in the past and I hope they'll help you as well. Kate talked to you a fair amount about making sure that you have a job description that really reflects who you want for the program, whether it's special skills or the times that they need to be there. So you'll have a list of absolute requirements and things that you want. You want that Spanish language teacher, but you'll hire somebody who's monolingual if that's all you can find. You need to have that list of requirements as well as the list of desired skills and abilities and training. Once someone comes in to apply for a job, they have one right and one responsibility, as do you as the potential employer. They have the right to be fairly considered for this position and they have the responsibility to give full, complete, honest answers to any questions. You have the right to full, complete, and honest answers to any of your questions and the responsibility to fairly consider them for this position. So once you have an applicant, whether it's an unsolicited resume or an application, you need to start objectively evaluating this potential candidate. So if they came in, I want you to write objectively what you saw. How were they dressed? How did they speak? Did they greet people? Write these things down. It'll help you with your objective evaluation. And make sure that you are fairly evaluating all applicants. If you don't have it anywhere in your application process, how long applications will be kept, you need to keep it indefinitely for the Department of Labor because they may need to go back and evaluate and ensure that you have not made hiring, firing, or promotion decisions based upon the seven protected classes such as gender, race, etc. Once you've got that application in hand or that resume in hand, look to see how well it matches up with your job description. You can give the applicant the job description when they apply for the job, or you can give it to them at the beginning of the interview or before the interview, or you can give it to them 
before you offer them the job. But at some point during the hiring process, you need to give them a copy of that so that if they have some sort of condition or life situation that's going to make it impossible for them to meet your requirements, they have an opportunity to self-disqualify. Okay, that's really important. Look at the applications, look at your notes from those applicants, and decide who you're going to move to interview. You may do a phone interview, you may do a live interview, you may do both, or you may do two live interviews, one with just one individual and a second with someone else or with a panel. All of these are perfectly okay. It depends on your program and what works for you. Something I think is incredibly helpful in the interviewing process is to take at least the top two or three applicants for the position and have them do what we call a working interview, which is part of their interview process. They will spend time in the classroom you're hoping to hire them for, or sometimes a particularly challenging classroom. Not as a member of staff, but as a participant and an observer. You want to see how they interact with the children. Do they have basic guidance principles? Do their actions match their words? Because a lot of times people know the right things to say, but when the rubber hits the road, they don't quite follow through with it. So having that working interview can really help cut down on some of that. Have a working interview if there's any way you possibly can. Allow them to just spend time in the classroom with your existing staff. Observe them for a little while and then come up with a reason to walk away and let them be in there without you, just with the people who would be their coworkers if they get the job. Once they leave, you can have a conversation with those employees and ask them what their feeling is about that person. A lot of times they see things that you didn't see because when the cat's away, the mice will play. We said that before, but it's totally true. Sometimes people ask unusual questions of your staff or behave in a way that you would not expect when you're not there. So it's a very useful tool to get at their values and their skills. Don't hire someone simply because you need a warm body. At least don't hire them and tell them they're a teacher. Oh, the number of times that we've gotten phone calls about this situation. If you do not have two people who you consider realistic candidates for a position, but you have to get someone in, offer them the position of a substitute. Offer that they can come on as a substitute, substitute in this room. And if you think there's a good chance they may end up with the job, tell them their first that tell them up front, be honest with them and say, I need to have at least two qualified candidates for any position. At this point, I don't have that. I'd like to offer you a substitute position and have you substitute in that classroom until or unless I get a second qualified candidate. I never know when Mary Poppins is going to come in the door. So in case Mary Poppins is looking for a new place to work, I need to have a second qual. I need to just put you in as a substitute at this time. As you can tell from my stuttering and stopping, it's not the easiest conversation to have, but it can save you so much headache in the long run. They know they may not get this position, but you have someone in the room and the staff have that relaxation and your clients know that the room has a consistent person. It helps. And sometimes that person that you thought maybe was the right person, you weren't sure and you didn't have the second candidate, turns out to be absolutely the right person. I've hired people who were basically hired by babies in my infant room. But I had them come on as substitutes first because they didn't have prior experience. 
sometimes you have a really good feeling and it turns out to so much payoff and other times your gut was wrong that one employee I had an infant who had the worst stranger anxiety I mean parents who dropped their kids off every day she would see and scream oh such stranger anxiety and I needed somebody right away. I was having to cover the classroom while I was doing interviews. So I did the interview in the classroom. Not the best idea, but sometimes emergencies happen. And I had to do the interview there and then because they were unavailable after hours until three days later. So we did the interview there. The applicant came in, sat down while I was doing uh, feeding of children in the high chair and I had another one in my lap with a bottle and they sat down on the floor and that child who had the incredible stranger anxiety crawled over and crawled up into his lap. I hired him but only as a substitute at first. You need to be able to let people go if they're not a right match and it's so much harder if you've told them they're a teacher and you've told the parents that they're a teacher to let them go two weeks later hmm some of you probably are going wait a second you hired a man to work in an infant classroom can you do that you absolutely can but you do need to be aware of the fact that there are biases out there some people are going to be uncomfortable with a man working with any of your age groups other than school age. However, there are so many children in today's world who do not have daily contact with a caregiving male that it is so helpful to have it in your program if you possibly can. And that can become part of your marketing, part of your marketing strategy. But even if you don't use it as part of your marketing strategy, I still suggest you try to hire some men. At least one. For one thing, it'll cut down on the gossip for most of your female staff. Because very few women want to be that gossipy girl when there's a man around. But that's not the real reason. The real reason is they bring a different energy into your program. And they give so much to the children in your program. My children are now teenagers, and I bet they could both tell you of several male teachers that they had when they were preschoolers at my program or after schoolers at my program. And I think they remember the guys more than the gals. I could be wrong. But those men really make an impression because they're different. They are. They have different tones of voice. They have different physicality. When they're out on the playground, they're moving, they're zooming, they're doing all kinds of stuff versus your female staff who have a tendency to seem to find uh, somebody else to talk to or perhaps a horizontal surface that can serve as this chair. In any case, please consider hiring men for your program. Took us a little off topic, but I think it's all right. Um, the next thing after you had that application and that interview and then hopefully the working interview is deciding who is the right match for your program. When you have them, offer them the position, tell them about all the benefits that you offer at your program. Don't sell yourself short. Whether the benefits you offer are just that you are closed during the week, five days during the year, or that they have discounted childcare, or you have a full Cadillac benefit package with health and dental and vision, sick leave, personal days, holidays, all of that. Whatever level of benefits you have, you have some benefits. They can eat with the children. You encourage them to eat with the children. They'll get continuing education. All of these things are benefits and we need to make sure we tell them about them at the time of hire. If you do not present things as benefits, people aren't as likely to see them as benefits. 
And the fact that you're going to help them get continuing education hours is a benefit and should be listed as such. Once you offer them the position and they accept, you've got a verbal contract. Once anything of value has been exchanged. So if you hand them the handbook and they work their first shift, you've got a verbal contract and a verbal employment contract. Texas is an outlaw state, which means anybody can quit or be fired at any time for any reason as long as it's not one of the protected classes. But you do have a contract. They agree to work under these conditions for this rate and you agree to pay them and give them those benefits. Okay. Once you've, once you've offered them the position and they've accepted, then you need to schedule an orientation day for them. You want the orientation to happen before their first day, if at all possible. Go over the handbook and you may need to do a pre-service training with them if they have not worked in child care before for at least six months. What are some things to do in that orientation? Well, Licensing tells me I need to go over minimum standards. Are we going to read that entire 200 pages in an orientation? Probably not. You need to hit on some high points. You also need to show them where the fire exits are. Um, do you have a fire extinguisher? Do they know where that is? Is there a bathroom that has adult-sized toilets and maybe a lock on the door? <laughs> um, what about where's the first aid kit? Where are the band-aids? Where's the form that you fill out when you put a band-aid on a child? All of these are things that you would cover in your orientation. Um, there's wonderful information in your book about orientation and I strongly suggest that you go around and when you're doing the orientation for your new employee, you introduce them to the other members of your staff and do it in such a way that they know how those people can be resources for them. And then have them start working for you. Send a note out to the parents letting them know about the wonderful new addition to your staff and let the good times roll. Kate mentioned having a pay scale. And I'm sure some of you were wondering why that needed to be part of the job description. Are you going to tell everybody when they apply what the most is that they can get paid for that job? Not necessarily. An awful lot of programs simply have the pay scale so that the administrator knows what is the most I'm going to pay somebody for that job. So take a minute and think about what is the minimum qualification for each of your job categories. I don't know what the job categories are at your program, whether you have a secretary or a cook or an assistant or a substitute director, assistant director, there's lots of options. Whatever job categories you have, write down every single one of them and what's the minimum qualifications and experience you would accept. I'll wait. Go ahead and pause it if you need to. You probably will and then come on back. Okay, you've got that done. So, here's the hard part. What would you pay that person who barely met the qualifications? Write down the minimum amount you would pay for somebody who has those absolute bare minimum qualifications. Again, pause the video so you have time to really think about it and come back. Okay, you've got the bottom end of your pay scale done. Great job! Now let's go to the far end. What would you pay somebody who had their PhD in early childhood education management as a director? <laughs> and who's been doing it for 20 years. What should that person get paid? Write down the highest level of qualifications you would consider 
for each one of those positions. Would you hire somebody with a master's degree to be a floater? If so, what would you pay them? So write the maximum level of qualifications for each one of those positions and the maximum salary you would pay them or hourly rate. It's important. Go ahead and pause it and do that. Now that you've got your entire pay scale done, throw some confetti in the air. Yay! Wonderful, wonderful. What do I do with this now? <laughs> um, presumably, Carrie had a point, right? W what are we supposed to do with it? <laughs> okay. Well, we have those applicants who came in to work, came in to try to work at our program. So perhaps this is somebody who's 23, has worked in childcare for a year, and is applying for a lead teacher position. Are they qualified? Do they meet your minimum requirements for that job? If so, where on that scale? How far over here towards the hot, oops, I guess that would be over here. How far um, towards the high end are they and how close to the low end are they? This is how you decide how much you pay them, not what they were paid at their last job. They may have been paid $25 an hour at their last job, but maybe they only worked there three hours a week. What they got paid at their last job is somewhat important, but not nearly as important as your pay scale because you should not be paying $25 an hour for somebody to be a floater at your program. I don't know what position at your program may pay $25 an hour. Not very many, if any. So think about where they fall on that pay scale. This makes it real easy to make ethical decisions about people's pay. Okay, thanks a lot.